Association, and it certainly is something that needs to be celebrated. Um, when I was growing up, people were off of work that day, except emergency personnel. That doesn't happen much anymore, and that's a bad, bad situation, and I intend to see that change. Now, my election day sermon, if you might say, and by the way, if I was doing an election day sermon at Beacon Hill or Concord, New Hampshire, or whatever, you would be involved for at least four hours. Okay? <laughs> so this is not going to go four hours. Do you think they prayed? And my subject, you might say, is do you think they prayed? And to whom do you think they prayed? Now I want to tell you something. I'm proud to be an American. I love my country. And I don't have to explain to anybody why I do. I just do. Like I love my mother, who's passed away. It's in my DNA. Though there are certainly many reasons why I should love my mama and love America. I'm proud and thankful that I qualify, qualify by the worth of birth, though I can take no credit for that, obviously, to be a member of the National Society Sons of the American Revolution. But what I can take credit for is for by God's amazing grace is what I do with that endowment. And faith without works is certainly dead. Now on our insignia, as you have heard here today, is the bust of a truly great man, George Washington, who believed in God. And unlike some in government today, he knew there was a God, and he knew that George Washington was not God. His belief and his actions made him a great man. Now, what would he say to us if he were standing here today? I think I do have some understanding. And as I tell people, though they be dead, yet do they still live amongst us, because we have a record of much of what they did and much of what they said. And we can read that. And of course, many people today who I consider to be the worst traitors in the country are revisionist historians that they don't like the history that we have, so they go about trying to change it. Now, you've heard about On the Cross of Malta. Glad to be able to wear that. About the bars, the limbs, the eight points representing the first commandment. And by the way, I said commandment because when Moses came down on Mount Sinai, he didn't bring the ten suggestions. He brought the ten commandments. Right? <laughs> love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with your mind. And secondly, to love your neighbor as thyself. And the cardinal virtues of prudence, justice, moderation, and all our actions fortitude, the generosity, and courage to serve God. And in this country right now, it does take courage to be a patriot and to serve God, no doubt about it. And the eight Beatitudes, right? To have spiritual contentment, to live without malice, to weep over your sins, to humble yourself at insults, to love justice, to be merciful, to be sincere and open-hearted, to suffer persecution. What's wrong with any of that? And I see nothing wrong with it at all. Libertas et Patria, liberty and country. And I want to tell you, with all my heart and with all my strength, I believe this doctrine. I believe that anyone who truly desires and prays for America to be better, and we hear all the time of everybody's got these ideas of how America is going to be better or return to a greatness that they don't seem to understand. If we're going to have a better, stronger, revived, renewed, and continue uh, to have America, the people need to understand what was, what was it that made America great in the first place. And will, by God's grace, employ these actions in their personal lives. We can change a lot of things very quickly by not being like the things that we don't believe in. So help me God, that's my pledge. Now I don't think it's an accident of birth that I'm a direct descendant of all members, as all the members are, of S-A-R, D-A-R, and C-A-R. Of those dedicated patriots who fought for liberty and freedom from a tyrant king. And I know that people are always on the British side trying to tell you, you know, about how nice King George III was in Parliament. It is not true. It is not true to us. They have their side of the story, and we have ours. And by the way, who won the war? Hello? <laughs> Many years ago in the town of my birth, Lexington, where the shot was fired that was heard around the world in the cradle of American liberty and for the cause of all mankind. And if you don't believe me when I'm telling you this, go on Lexington Green, be there July 9th, 
Joel is doing Concord. I'm doing the tour over there. I will show you where it is written. It is there. And I didn't come out with my Dremel tool the night before. I put it there. <laughs> so many years ago, I was standing there. And it's interesting, when you're on the green there, you'll see people come from all over the world, just like we're hearing today from somebody who's come from way across the world and is reading from his script that he wrote, or his document that he wrote, beautifully done, going to Lexington High School, and I went there for a while. And I want to tell you, that's America. We incorporate people that come in here, though they don't have the blood. They have the ethic, or they have the philosophy. They have the understanding of what America is about. And so I'm very thankful about that. There was a person named Alexis de Tocqueville. He was a Frenchman. Okay? He came with a judge over here, and he wanted to understand why America was so strong, and yet America was so young compared to France. And France had gone through a revolution. And let me tell you, folks, anyone that tells you that the American Revolution and the French Revolution have anything in common, there's only one thing they have in common, the word revolution. That's all, nothing else. Very different principles, war for independence in America. And so that's where we get the word, or the phrase, American exceptionalism. And America has been exceptional in many ways. And just like I said I love my mother, my mother was never a perfect woman. She did a lot of things, but that doesn't mean that I shouldn't love her, even though she wasn't perfect. And America is not perfect, never has been, never will be. But we should love our country, and if we don't, how are we ever going to participate in seeing better things happen for our country if we don't love her? And I have come to understand this. If you don't love somebody, you can't help them. If you don't love your country, you can't really help your country. You just have some other thing. Many people have come here from all over the world, and like most of you in here, I've got ancestry from many different places that I'm very proud of. And they came here for what reason? Because they could not find the things that America has or had in their own country. And so they came here and left the countries of their birth. Isn't it interesting that Baroness uh, Lady Margaret Thatcher, the British PM from 17, or 1979 to 1990, she spoke more affectionately, more highly and knowledgeably of America's mm -hmm. founding than many Americans do. That's very sad to say, to think that somebody from a foreign country would speak more highly about America than many Americans. And excuse me if I go around telling people when I hear certain things, like a guy came up to me yesterday and wanted to say he was leaving America, he's going to the Caribbean because America's lost, and it's so bad. I said, you picked the wrong guy. <laughs> and before I was done with him, he was ready to sell a sailboat and said, and I said, beside the fact, you think you're going to go down to that place that you're going to on your sailboat, and you're the un ugly gringo, and they're going to just love that you have left your country and come down there to take over theirs? They're going to really appreciate it. <laughs> so when we think about this, don't fire unless fired upon. But if they mean to have a war, let it begin here. And actually, that was not only said on Lexington Green, it was said right here on the Concord Bridge as well. They did not mean to have a war. They did not want to have a war. They didn't want to uh, fire and, uh, defensively. They fired defensively, not offensively. Who would want to stand against the most formidable military force in the world except people that had great conviction, like what we have to do, those in battle farmers that stood there? Now, indeed, the time is always at hand when patriots, American patriots, must reaffirm whether we're to be free men or slaves. <coughs> Thomas Jefferson said, honor, justice, and humanity permit us tamely to surrender that freedom which we received from our gallant ancestors, and which our innocent posterity, that's us, have a right to receive from us. Nowhere is it written or guaranteed that America will always remain free, especially when those who are commissioned to keep her so break their oaths. And we hear that and see that all the time. In fact, Thomas Jefferson and other founders warned about threats to our freedom. Jefferson noted that the price of freedom is what? There's a quiz, you know, after this. No more Barry Cobbler over there. Eternal freedom. Eternal vigilance. That's right. Eternal vigilance. In 1776, George Washington wrote in his general orders, the time is now near at hand which we must determine whether Americans 
are to be free men or slaves. Whether they are to have property, they can call their own. Whether their houses and farms are to be pillaged and destroyed and themselves consigned to a state of wretchedness from which no human efforts will deliver them. The fate of unborn millions will now depend, under God, on the courage and conduct of this army. Our cruel and unrelenting enemy leaves us only the choice of brave resistance or the most abject submission. We have therefore reserved and resolved to conquer or die. I'm thinking about the Battle of Trenton, December 25th, 1776, crossing the Delaware up against 2,000 Hessians. And our compatriot over here, both he and I are <coughs> alumni of Valley Forge Military Academy. We know that area over there, right? 2,000 Hessian mercenaries. Do you think that George Washington prayed before that battle? And who do you think he prayed to? Or whom? Now, how can it be in our America, we're told now, we can't pray. We can't pray as they did. We can't mention the name of God. Do we no longer have the desire to be free, or to grow, or to prosper, or to win at what is important? Should we do what they did and defend our declaration and all it contains? And I hope you'll say, huzzah. I'm saying huzzah, amen. How say you, compatriots? <laughs> Can the liberties of a nation be secure when we have removed a conviction that these liberties are a gift of God? President number three, who was, I told you, is a quiz, Thomas Jefferson. My primary mission in life, and I hope it would be yours as well, has been and will remain until my last breath the support in defense of the unalienable rights of all people to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, because those rights are endowed by our Creator. Such rights are not temporal, they're eternal. I've never been under the illusion, you might say, that the full endowment of liberty was something to be achieved during my lifetime. It just seems like the war for American independence goes on from year to year, doesn't it? Yes. So for our lifetime and that of our children and beyond, that endowment is a continuing process. And the singular blessing that we must, as Patrick Henry warned us, guard with jealous attention for all human history. Now I want to take just a moment here, before I read the rest of this, and tell you something that happened to me quite a number of years ago. Growing up in Lexington, it was a small town at the, the time my family had been there, you know, I've got 400 years of ancestry, no further south than Plymouth, Massachusetts. I like playing baseball. I like playing hockey. I like playing football. I like skiing. I like anything like rough and tumble stuff, going out in the woods and playing, you know, survivalist out there and so forth and so on. And so the things that my mother taught me about our heritage and walking by that sacred ground, the Lexington Green, and seeing that handsome, green man carrying that musket, I said to myself one day, I want to be like him. Not necessarily being green, but <laughs> <laughs> standing tall and holding the musket and whatever else. It wasn't until many years later after I traveled throughout all over the United States and Canada and so forth, lived other places, that the Lord called me back home to my native land. And I'm standing there in front of the Lexington Green in front of the Minuteman, looking up, thinking about my childhood and so forth. Now, I'm not saying if you were standing beside me, you would have heard this, but this is what I heard. Because I said, oh, Lord, I really respect the, uh, the saints of the Bible. And I heard this, well, you should respect them. But they're not here now. I'm looking to you. And then I said, I so, Lord, I so respect the patriots of the cause for American freedom and liberty to which I heard, and you should respect them, but they're not here now, I'm looking to you. And so I'm saying to you, my compatriot, brothers and sisters, I do appreciate that you brought up about the women, because that's true, founding fathers and founding mothers, no doubt about that. But they're not here now, we're here now. And I want to tell you, if people can look down from heaven, I don't want my ancestors looking down saying, You've been a slouch. You've been slothful. You haven't really been out there standing up for what we stood up for. Now, I'm not trying to lay a guilt trip on anybody, but I want to tell you that George Washington, in his farewell address in 1791, said this. 
he advised his fellow citizens that religion and morality were the great pillars of human happiness. These firmest props of the duties of men and citizens, national morality, he added, could not exist in the exclusion of religious principle. Virtue or morality, he concluded, as the products of religion, were a necessary spring of popular government. George Washington was a Christian, and here was his prayer, and we know to whom he prayed. And by the way, as people have asked me, hey, where'd you get that tie? I got it when I was doing a service down in Mount Vernon at the tomb of George and Martha Washington, where they paid good money to have scripture about Jesus Christ and the resurrection engraved before they died on their tomb, before they were even entombed. That tells you something. So this tie, and it wasn't made in China, by the way. <laughs> China makes a lot of stuff for us. Um, I don't know that they're making these ties in China. And so I bought it there, and I was glad to have it. And so this is what George Washington's prayer was. He asked God to dispose us all, to do justice, to love mercy, and demean ourselves with that charity, humility, and pacific temper of mind, which were the characteristics of the divine author of our blessed religion without a humble imitation of whose example in these things we can never hope to be a happy nation and I want to tell you folks that were born in China you know one of the most moving things that ever happened to me in my life was watching on television that people in Tiananmen Square were being killed by Chinese as they were standing holding Liberty Bells and holding up the Statue of Liberty that they were willing to die looking for freedom that touches my heart because the movement of America for freedom and liberty is not just for us. Those people that fought on that green did not think, or the people that fought on that bridge did not think it was only for them, or just even for their posterity, but the world. The shot heard what? Around, Around the world. world. That's right. So we asked that we would dispose us all to do justice, to love mercy, and demean ourselves with that charity, humility, pacific temper of mind, which were the characteristics of the divine author of our blessed religion, without a humble imitation of whose example in these things we can never, we can never, did I say that before? We can never be a happy nation. And I told you that John 11, verses 25 to 26, is on the tomb of George and Martha Washington. Now, I don't consider myself to know any better than George Washington did. I know we're, you know, he didn't have a, Samsung Galaxy S6 like I do. <laughs> but that hasn't made me any smarter. I can tell you the man understood things that people today do not understand. His ways should be my ways always. Holy Spirit guide, teach me, I pray. Now just to show you, and I am part English and Irish and Scott and so forth, and yes, I have a great grandmother that came from Manchester, England to Spring Hill, Nova Scotia, and then came to America and became a citizen. Um, I have that ancestry, but I just want to tell you my affability towards the English, even though I give Paul O'Shaughnessy and uh, the people that come to Bunker Hill, I tell them, hey, if I'm in charge of this, you're not even invited. <laughs> what you did to us was terrible. We didn't do to you what you did to us, okay? And that's a fact, and I can prove it. But just to show you my affability, I'm going to sing a little song by an English vicar, just to prove to you that I don't hold anything against him and I forgive him, right? Faith of our Father, we will strive to win all nations unto thee, and through the truth that comes from God, the world shall see, we'll truly be free. Faith of our Father's holy faith, we will be true. To thee till death. God bless this honorable assembly, and may God continue to bless these states of America United as only He knows how. Oh,